So I love that you clapped because that, that, is, that is what this world is. It's, it's, it's about creative energies. And we're on stage with an artist, Takashi, uh, who has uh, been in the business of, of interpreting creative energies for 30 years. Uh, first, uh, a, a Japan in the wake of World War II. Later on, the energies that, that flowed from the tragedy of the 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and Fukushima disaster. And now, uh, at this time, post-2020. So I wanted to start uh, with Takashi. Could we get slide number two? Takashi, I wanted to ask you about uh, what, you, what you refer to uh, as, a, as a cognitive revolution with the world of the metaverse and NFTs. Oh. And I wanted to ask you about this moment. I wanted to ask you about this moment in the game Animal Crossing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This and is, what you experienced yeah. with your son. Yeah, yeah this is uh, maybe a firework night. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm I, I'm sorry about uh, you know cannot you know telling about uh, background in English, but I want to you know using for the Yuko Sakata, the translator. あの、2020年の5月、4月か5月ぐらいにまあ、あの完全に学校があの行けなくなっちゃって、うちの息子と娘がめちゃくちゃ兄弟喧嘩して、あの、もう殴り合いになり、殴り合いの喧嘩をし
at work and said, oh, well, tomorrow we're going to start making games. And, but I don't play games, so I know nothing about it. And I thought, well, maybe the primitive one, like Tamagotchi-style game, maybe I can make. So that's what I'm, I'm continuing to work on right now, but this was definitely what started it. So I love this, I love this story. And, and, and last night at dinner, Takashi, you, you described um, interaction with the world of gaming as, as, as very much a dopamine rush, as something that affects you physically, uh, and that that was, a, and that was an element of, of, of you recognizing how powerful this space was. Uh, <laughs> そうね、あの、で、え、娘はまあ平和的にえ、で、ま、学校に行くっていう、ま、あの、5日間ぐらいの連休ずっとフォートナイトやってたんだけど、ま、その時は良かったんですよ、別に。あ、なんか熱中してるなと思って。だけど、もう学校始まったらもう学校行き
to what this space is all about. The fact that, uh, that so much time is spent uh, being online and dwelling online and in gaming, uh, it makes the, uh, the world of the NFT make a lot more sense. Uh, could we get slide number seven? I want to pivot uh, to Benoit, and I want to ask. Stuff to say yeah, what was said before ask, as well. Can you hear me? No, I wanted <laughs> so, to say like so. Animal Crossing did a lot for the pandemic. A lot of people felt very good thanks to Animal Crossing, mm -hmm. the game you showed before, because we are all stuck at home and with some you know, weird news on TV every day. Oh, what's going on? And, and if you had Animal Crossing, you were on your island. You had really nice music. You had super cool animal friends giving you gifts. Uh, you, could, uh, you could trade uh, the radish. I don't know. I don't, I don't know the English. I was making radish trading and meeting people online to make sure they have the best price. So there was an economy as well. You can decorate it, and you can visit other friends' island. And me had a great time on Animal Crossing during the pandemic, and I'm not the only one. I think there was articles that it helped a lot of people go through a potential depression, because you had like this, you know, Nintendo is the best at making a really cute, well-made well worlds. They're not a company that is making these, you know, what you talk about about the addiction is called gameplay reward loops. So we try every five minutes to have something to do in a game, so you come back to it and you, you just you know, feel rewarded and, and you love it. And Animal Crossing, they always did, uh, and Nintendo, they always do it in a way that is making you a bit uh, enlightened and you know, discover and really trigger that sense of discovery and interaction. And so uh, I don't know how many of you played Animal Crossing during the pandemic, if you can raise your hand or something. Uh, not enough, you should have played more, <laughs> you'd would be, you would be happier. But it's a very, very important game that people, you know, sometimes just think it's a children's game. But a lot of adults played it uh, during the pandemic, and I think it, it helped a lot of people to go through potential uh, depression. I think there were some, you know, proper intelligent people who wrote stuff about that, not me. So it's very important. And what he said about the, um, his son being addicted to games, so you need to be careful what type of game they play. But to me, I don't have a son, but if he's like DT, I would be happy. I would be a lot more happy that he plays game every day than he's posting bullshit on Instagram every day. Uh, not really, because in games, it's not only you're not only playing. First, it's making, it's making you work your reflexes, especially in competitive type of games like Fortnite. It's making you tr trigger on your social interactions. You meet people, etc. And as well, you know, Fortnite is a very, very creative game because it's not static. Epic is constantly updating the map, updating the new features they have on Unreal to be featured on Fortnite. So it's, that's, I understand people can get addicted because compared to your, if your life is a normal life and you don't have rich parents flying you everywhere, uh, like uh, Fortnite is a lot more interesting than your normal daily routine you can have as a, as a student, especially if you are not someone who's very, uh, how do you say in English, outspoken at school or stuff like that. Games can be a way for you to express yourself in a way more creative way and have a lot more friends. And I think it shouldn't be, I think the media overall in the past 20 years tried to have that, that narrative around addiction and all of, you know, games is bad and it's violent when if you really start to get interested in it and you need to, if you want to understand the future in my opinion, you, ca you start to see it's a lot deeper than these mainstream big games and these big stories the media is making about, like there's amazing, you know, um, creative stories, love stories, uh, like community stories happening in games and the game itself as a technology. Not only game makers are using it, but now, you know, stuff like Animal Crossing, there's a big business of really smart kids who are making patterns and artwork, t-shirts. Uh, they're making, you know, super famous islands. You can check on YouTube uh, island tours. Well, there's a guy who's a journalist who was during the pandemic and I worked with him on a project, a cool guy. Uh, and he was just doing an uh, island video tour on YouTube to visit the based islands with the owner of the island, showing him around and explaining how he positions stuff. And, and because Animal Crossing and most of the games are constrained by design, what's cool is that the really, really smart people, they use that constraint to make something you think is impossible to do. And that's the really beautiful thing to see because in every game, especially the Nintendo games, there's always people who manage to create on top. And that's the best thing about games, it's an interactive medium. It's not just you play and you get addicted, it's some, something that is developing your creativity and a lot more uh, you know, of your personality. So sorry if I dis disturbed oh, no, you. Uh, I no, wanted to a, say a, Animal a, Crossing a, is cool, you should play it. It's a great, way, <laughs> it's a great way to transition into your collaboration together. Okay. And one of the things uh, at the Broad Museum when we worked with uh, uh, Instagram and Spark AR and, and Buck Studio, uh, 
I was, I was blown away by the, by the technical ability of, of, of artists and creators uh, in this space. And I know that anyone that enters this world has quite a learning curve, uh, and it is a, it, it's, it's a hard world to enter. It's hard if you didn't play games. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and as, yeah. as you know, I have a lot of experience with that. Yeah, but I'm training you at... Yeah. You know, we, we have <laughs> So I want to ask, I want to ask Takashi, uh, Takashi, how did the collaboration uh, with Benoit come about, uh, and how uh, how did the relationship uh, with Artifact uh, become the the beautiful work that you've made together? Uh, by the way, the you may be like over eighty percent is the Artifact fans here, but. Uh, you know, you are the super lucky because uh, you can watch into the Bruno's face right now. <laughs> because, you know, when we did a, a Zoom meeting, you know, anytime they hiding a face. <laughs> Zoom meeting, hiding a face. Artifacts, you know, four or five people. Just, you know, accounting people, like, uh, like uh, who is that, Nikhil? Yeah. Nikhil, you know, become to the face, <laughs> but uh, you know, why? So we have to making a Zoom. It's uh, really, you know, strange. <laughs> so kind of that mentality, that was a shock because my son is anytime to hiding, you know, the face when I, you know, taking a photo or something. He he hate that. So, but uh, you know, uh, recently they using for the uh, avatar, right? Mm -hmm. The, it's kind of the Chromex avatar, and uh, this avatar can move the eyeball and the mouse. And uh, you know who is that? Is a uh, Chromex guys. Yeah. So no, and Takeshi was with his food. Oh wait, take your video. Yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> was so surprised. <laughs> it looks like that. You know, completely. You know, my impression the artifact is a, you know, geek team. Right, and also the one guy in the Costa Rica, one guy is uh, uh, Dubai, yeah. one you know he from the Paris, and the one guy is a uh, Utah. It's you know strange. I am Japan, and uh, you know uh, the Yuko is a translation in New York. Mm -hmm. It's uh, and, then, and it's then, always me at 3 a.m. in Paris. In oh, <laughs> oh, sorry about no, that. No, that's fine. For Takeshi Sensei, oh, 3 a.m. 4 a.m. I fine. didn't know that. No, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, but uh, yeah, kind of that completely different dimension people, like, uh, and then starting a big business, and uh, you know, oh, why, so this guy lives in Costa Rica, maybe tax reduction or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, they say, you know, how old does he, like a 25, oh my God. So I never thinking about, you know, that my age, so that is a, oh, this is a country not created. This is a businessman, that's <laughs> it. So, but, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, the, in the process, making for the creative is uh, super creative and uh, super smooth because they knew very much to understanding for the how way is the best way to the smooth, you know, creative. So, you know, uh, draw, I send it to the drawing and uh, send back to the 3D data. And sometimes I am not satisfied with this data and uh, we tune in uh, my studio. And then uh, back to the, you know, Artifact Studio and I, their team uh, renovate more. So it's, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, process is uh, very easy, very smooth more than, you know, any other collaborator. So mostly, you know, best, you know, communication. And then uh, launch in uh, Chrome X, the avatars. That quality is in, uh, we can see the small JPEG. Oh, this is great. So this is great. That is uh, my impression. And then, okay, so please, I, I want to make it for the big painting. And uh, I expanded for the, this data. That moment was, I was so surprised because the quality is perfect. You know, like a 2.0 meter, I don't know how inches, but uh, you know, super big. We can watch into the, in detail in, uh, how, I don't know, like, uh, how can I say, net mm -hmm. in uh, fabric yeah. and uh, in the skin. And uh, you know, everywhere is, uh, you know, precisely 
to take care about the you know, 3D CZ. It looks like a kind of uh, my dream you know, of the computer graphics stuff, like uh, you know, Weta or like IRM or something like that quality. So that is a uh, you know, amazing next, next generation. That is my impression in the creativity. Well, I'm sure you want to see what a clone X looks like. How about slide number three? Well, here we are. So, um, uh, you, you can, okay, so when you see that this image, you cannot understand. <laughs> yes, because, you know, I understanding for the art history and the art, you know, paintings, and I translate it to the painting. That moment, so my team surprised, you know, oh my God, like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, speechless. Like, uh, now, so we hanging a wall in the Gagosha, New York. When you have a uh, possible to the chance for see the paintings, you can understand what, what you're talking about, what I'm talking about right now. Sorry. So, so Benoit, what, what did this experience look like on your side? No, for and us, it was, side? it was really amazing because we're huge fans of uh, Takashi since a long time. And, and at Artifact, we only work with people we love, and he's the guy we love the most. So it was <laughs> like the best thing ever. But the process was really great because, as he said, it was really smooth, you know, like uh, ping pong, like super fast ping pong. And we did it quite fast as well. Honestly, I don't like a couple of months, I think we did everything. And, and we knew that we had to respect the sensei's work, and we wanted to make sure that any feedback he had, we would implement. But it was super smooth every time we sent something. And I think we should saw that one day that like him and his team was making very, very precise little adjustment or drawings with little you know, Japanese uh, kanji next to it. And we just, as soon as they send something back, we update, we send him back. And just everything started to make sense. And even though he said it was smooth, it was very, very, very chaotic how we were working on, on our side. Because we're always working in some type of chaos, which is we think is really good, you know energy to create something new. But in the end, you know, every day we're seeing progress being made, the feedback being sent. We're all happy about what we did. I think the last one we did was the, the dub hat, I think, where the last piece of feedback. And, uh, and that's it, and then we're ready to launch, and we launched, and for us it was really an amazing experience because I think it's, us, we come from video game, that's why you know, we're really good, at especially Chris on, on our team that did all of that. Because in video game, you need to, to have as many details as you can, but still keep it optimized for video games. So the good thing is all of this, and we're working on some you know, game-related stuff, not to give some alpha too much, but uh, like the, all of this is gonna, you know, it's, it's for real-time 3D, it's ready to go, but all the details are baked in, and it's techniques you learn from video games from you know, years of, of game making. But I really like the fact that us were coming from this world, Takashi from a very, very, very precise world, but magically I think we combine to still keep the speed that we have at Artifact, and we, and we also benefit a lot from his, his way of thinking about quality and about craftsmanship, and we have the you know, video game making craftsmanship, and you merge it together, and I think it made something very, very unique. You know, the clones don't look like any other Avatar project, and it will be forever the first you know, avatar uh, project from Artifact and Takashi Murakami. So forever it will be legendary, I think, and we have a lot more stuff coming around that, but the process was really you know, smooth and magical for us. Good thing is that we continue to do things together, so I think we, it's not every day you can find someone where you can have that type of uh, creative flow, because it's really some type of flow states you're in, and it's just back and forth. Yuko has been as well amazing at, you know, getting us the feedback in a smooth way. So I think we make really, really good team, and, it, and you know, when you have a good team, you need to keep it and, and, and you know, continue to innovate, so that's what we're, we're doing. And the process was easy, it was just an Instagram message, and I sent him a lot of emojis. He sent, he sent emojis saying he was not speaking English, then I took Google Translate, uh, and then we got the call, but uh, that's it. Mm. Thank you, I hate Insta Facebook, but thanks Instagram for that uh, DM. <laughs> So just to, uh, just to build on that uh, and, the, and the precision of these images, uh, I have to admit that wor working with Kaikai Kai Kiki and Takashi on the exhibition at the Broad, I became um, very obsessed uh, with Takashi's Instagram feed. 
I would wake up in the morning and see what Takashi is doing, what Takashi is saying, uh, how he would go about during his day uh, while I was studying the exhibition. And I remember seeing the Clone X for the first time. Uh, and I, and I, was, I was reading about uh, how Takashi had interpreted uh, sort of energies in Japan uh, after World War II, uh, energies after the, uh, after the earthquake. And here, here these uh, avatars are. Um, they have tentacles uh, coming out of their mouths. Uh, they have uh, gas masks on. And so even though, even though um, often the metaverse gets sort of uh, seen as a potential utopia, uh, what we were experiencing during COVID-19 is worn on the very faces of these avatars. Uh, and it fits the logic of what Takashi has been doing for 30 years. It also seemed to be very forward thinking. Uh, it seems to be what is next. Very, very exciting. However, uh, the, the world of the NFT and the avatars is very, is very diverse. Could we see uh, slide number four? And this is another question for Benoit. This is, you, you said last night at dinner that, that there are many different types of aesthetics going on in the world of NFTs. Uh, some are, uh, uh, and this is generational. Could you talk about that a little bit and how, and how the aesthetics of the NFT are playing out currently and where they may be going? Because I think the cool thing about NFTs is that's um, an art movement that is born on the internet. And so, of course, it's taking its reference from internet. Internet is made of, you know, forums, fan art, uh, you know, pictures, uh, pixel art, video games, all of this. So, and I think for now, NFTs is very, you know, on the art side, is born purely on an aesthetical level. There's no conceptual thinking, really. It's not there yet where, you know, there's a big idea behind or an artist that has a, a big work of art to tell a big vision or a big point of view on the world. And it purely started as an aesthetic and, and very powerful aesthetic because as well it's, it's on the screen, so a lot of it is animated. And, and us as you know, video game people who are used to see animations, who are used that when we touch something it reacts, like, you know, interactivity is a big thing. And I think in the aesthetic of NFTs, and you can see with Beeple, we are like big fan of, like Beeple, he was known because he was doing everyday, super fast, uh, kid bashing type of artwork which was always you know, very, very present because every day there was something going in the news on the internet and he was taking whatever he had in his mind creatively and putting it out because he had to respect this you know, uh, Spartan thing of having one thing every day, which is very, very hard. But every day artist is something that is born on the internet as well, you know, quite regularly, thanks to Instagram that became you know, the number one platform for artists to be discovered. And I think on the NFT side so far, like there's been even though it's quite you know, uh, young, uh, you can still have some type of uh, legacy. You have the CryptoPunks with the pixel art that to me is still today one of the best examples of pixel art. And why pixel art? Because pixel art has been in video games like a, an art form that has been there forever and still today, oh my voice is shit, it's weird. Uh, the, that's still in the, art, in, the, in the video game world, you still have a game made in 8-bit today because it's, a, it's an art to master pixels and tell the story through pixels, just like there is, you know, in min minimalism or any type of movement, how do you convey an idea through the, the minimum of the, you know, canvas or whatever, you know, oil stuff you're using. And so I think it will always be there, but you can see there is the pixel art in the NFT, which Takashi, I think you will speak about it, I think he blew even further with the flower project. You have a lot of things, and it was like that early days in crypto, in, crypto, in NFT art, and which I hated, to be honest, but just like in the past art movement, you were using gods or religious figures. In NFT, they were using astronauts, and I was really tired of seeing astronauts <laughs> all the time, but because it's characters that is still from the same culture of science fiction, uh, video games, so that's like the type of heroes and figures that you know, are representing you know, the movement and they're evolving every day. And the weird thing with NFT art is that if you see something good, you can copy it if you're good the next day and release it. So there's a big copycat culture, which is a, you know, very linked to internet remix culture and meme culture. But that's part, I think, of the movement as well of, you know, 
even though you can make it easily and you can copy it, you have the provenance on blockchain that says, you know, is it really the artist who made it? And as well, who's the first one who's opening that door to that new, you know, new thing we can do with NFTs? Because the cool thing with NFTs is that it's very, very, very new. And every day you, you can, you know, open a door that no one thought about, right? That might be a door that has, you know, just one small exit or has a many paths that many people can take behind you. So I think pixel art as an art form has always been very, very expressive. But in NFTs, you know, it's going to be a part, you know, part of it, just like there will be pixel art based games. But then after, it's going to go a lot towards what we as, you know, the 25, 30 uh, type of people grew up with, which is video games, sci-fi and um, animes and manga. So all of this is going to translate in, into the art of NFTs. Yeah, I was really, I, I was really surprised that, that uh, you know, pix, Pixel, it, it's, it's almost like classicism. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's the Madonna and child yeah. of the NFT. Um, Takashi, I wanted to ask you about the Flower Project uh, and, so, and, and how it was developed and some of the, the challenges in developing your, your Flower Project NFT. <clears throat> さっきちょっとお話ししたあのたまごっちの、えー、プロジェクトやってる時にそのプロデューサーが、まあ、たまたまこのデザインをピローンって僕に送ってきたんですよなぜかというとたまごっちの中で、えー、動かせるアニメーションって結構やっぱドット絵なんでそれすごい可愛かったんで「あこれじゃあ,あのいいですね」なんて言っていろんな色で T シャツ作ったりしてた、まあ、こ,のこの T シャツ作ったんですよね。去年その彼がそのデザインを作ってくれた瞬間に作ってみんなで「えーん」って喜んだんですけどあのー、であでもこれで NFT できるんじゃないかなと思って、まあ、1万個とか2万個とかそういうものを作っていくっていうので、まあ、色を変えたり顔の表情を変えたりすればできるんじゃないのかなと思ってでいろいろこう話してたんですけど最初はすごい簡単にオープンシーで、えー、やろうと思ったんですよ。だけどそしたらあの、えー、独自コントラクトっていうのに載せないとダメなんじゃないのっていうのがなんかちょっと我々の間で話題になっちゃってそうすると今から6ヶ月ぐらい時間かかりますよって言われてそれ意味が分かんないですね。であとそのいやじゃあどうせだったらクリプトパンクスと同じような、えー、形式でやりましょうよって言ったら「ああいいっすね」なんて言ってそしたらフルオンチェーンでやんなきゃいけないって言って「ああそれいいっすね」みたいな。でそのフルオンチェーンでやるっていうとあとプラス1年かかりますよって言って「いやいやじゃあボワードエイトヨットクラブどうなってんの?」とかそういうのでもうめっちゃくちゃ何が何だか分かんなくなっちゃってでそのプロデューサーはもうあのたまごっちのゲームに集中してもらって別のチームを立ててそ,れそこから始めたんですけどとにかく覚えなきゃいけない単語とかたくさんあって。大体,大体今も僕もペラペラ言ってますけどいまだによく分かんないことがたくさんあってあのさっきもいろいろブナーさんにいろいろ聞いたりしてたんですけどそういう,こう全然分からない世界の全く分からないリアリティの価値観であるとか何、えー、て言うんですかねそのコミュニケーションしている土台を理解するまでが約1年弱かかったかな。でそこから、まあ、え画像は画像で、まあ、最終的に絵にするっていうのは僕のゴールだったんで、えー、そこからなんかいろんなものをドロップして、えー、なんか、えー、自分のホルダーを楽しませるっていうことはあんまり考えておらずその当時最初の頃は、まあ、とにかく自分の絵が一万何千枚できてでそれを絵にしたらそれで終わりと思ってたりしたんですけどにしても学べば学ぶほどすごいこうややこしいことがあるんだが。でも僕がずっとアートの世界でだんだん飽きてきた状況からするともう,そう知らないことだけでめちゃくちゃ興奮する日々だったのでその意味で今もまだ勉強中でなかなかうまく進まないんだけどっていう感じで結構苦戦なんていうコンセプトというか世界を理解するのにものすごく苦戦するプロジェクトではあります。So, like I said, when I was,、um, you know, starting to make the Tamagotchi type game,、um, the producer、um, suggested this design, the very simple、uh, dot flower design, because that's the kind of thing that you can move in the Tamagotchi style game, and it had to be the dot art. So immediately I said, "Oh, that's great!" And then we made a T-shirt 
like this. And, um, and then after that, I said, oh, maybe this could be good for NFT art. And uh, maybe you know, if, if I need 10,000 or 20,000, I can just change the colors and facial expressions, and maybe I can just do that. So my first attempt, I was just really simply going to do, um, release it on OpenSea. And then my team, um, we were started talking about, oh, maybe, maybe we should have independent um, um, smart contract. We shouldn't just use what's available. Um, and then I was told then, well, in order to do that, it's going to be six more months. And then I, I didn't understand you know, why, why that would be. And then someone else said, oh, let's then, while we, we'll work on it, let's do, try to do something like CryptoPunks. And I said, okay, that sounds great. And then, oh, then it has to be, everything has to be full on chain. And uh, okay, that sounds good. And then, oh, they, they told me, oh, then it's gonna take another year. <laughs> and uh, then we're talking about Board Ape Yacht Club and all these other NFTs that are coming out. And it just all got confusing and uh, so, uh, I, I didn't know what we're talking about, and so I had the game producer go back and focus on my Tamagotchi game, and then uh, started making my uh, uh, separate team to work on NFT. So I've been I've been talking about all these um, the terminology, but I actually don't know um, much of it, and uh, I'm constantly learning. Uh, just earlier uh, off stage, Benoit was teaching me even more about different terminologies. Um, so it's the world that I'm really not, you know, not yet completely understanding, of course, and just to establish the, the basis of communication, um, for me, it took uh, about a year. Um, so for me, it's really about, um, you know, what I do is to, to create uh, visual, um, you know, paintings and um, art. So I was just at first thinking about creating all these different flowers and then dropping them, releasing them, and, you know, I wasn't thinking about further uh, letting the holders of the NFT enjoy or developing the world or anything like that. So I thought, oh, I will just release this and that'll be it. But the more I learn about it, it's really complicated and um, the more things I don't know emerge. So it's actually very exciting. So I'm still constantly learning and it's really hard to make progress. But um, yeah, so really to um, input this type of, uh, and understand that this new world has been a big challenge. What is really crazy about this is that everything that was just said, I mean, we're, we're not talking about six years here. We're talking about six months, six weeks, six days sometimes. And so, uh, uh, well. That's why if I make us you never, something people need to realize that they did all the flowers by hand. Uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's crazy because a lot of the projects are very lazy. They just use an algorithm and mix, you know, layers around and it's making apes, uh, kangaroos, whatever you want. Like, they, well, kangaroos are cool, I've got nothing against them and the apes as well. But uh, they did, which I think is crazy when you think of pixel art as well. That's why it's really pixel art and it's hard what they did. Like, they did all by hand and it's not even the process when you think of to me, it's the hardest thing is, I don't know how they did, because when he told me, I asked him, like, did you make them by hand? Because I had the feeling they did. And he said, yeah, I'm very ashamed. We did all by hand. I said, man, you know, don't be ashamed. You need to be super proud. Because imagine, and it's not only making the 11,000. It's how do they keep track of what they did before? Because when you use an algorithm, it knows not to repeat itself, right? But they really use, you know, I don't know what type of human process to keep track of what, uh, humans are pretty cool. Huh? Uh, the human process to keep track of how to make all these uniques, and I think it, it really shows, personally I still didn't open mine because I'm in hotel Wi-Fi and I don't trust hotel Wi-Fi to open, but I saw a lot of people opening them and you can tell that there's been really thought behind each, there's hidden references, hidden Easter eggs, so even though he says you know he doesn't know, I think that's great because if you think you know, you lose because we all are learning together, but without knowing, he already knows a lot more because he's got that culture and that curiosity that made it do, I think, one of the best projects of the year. And the fact he you know, had it at the Gagosian and merged words like this, and I think people will realize how important that project is in NFT art history, because we're very, very, as you said, six months in. People will realize how important it was you know, years from now. Like, it's very important. That's it, it just pumping technology. His in. understanding position is, really high, right? Mm -hmm. That's why he said, handmade is great, but it looks like a you know, teacher said to kindergarten kids, oh, your painting is great. <laughs> looks like that. 
Oh my God, I'm again shame here, right? <laughs> but true, like, but you know, I'm very respectful of the technology stuff because uh, right now is little by little, like when I'm making for the flower painting, mm -hmm. I was, you know, push the button and then, you know, change the color. That's, you know, I making with uh, some, you know, uh, technician with uh, professional people. But, uh, you know, that means that life, you know, time is very short. That's why we have to shortcut. Yeah. So that means that, you know, this project was, you know, like my assistant, uh, like uh, two ladies mm -hmm. cannot go back to home. This is uh, illegal maybe. So. <laughs> So, but, uh, you know, uh, well, it's, uh, that's, that's why I need a technology right now. Yeah, but, uh, you know, he has, and I don't have yet. I really want to get this technology. So they can go back home. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, I think, we're, I think we're almost to the time of, of, of questions, but I did, want, I, I did want to look at slide number five. Um, which is the, which is the shoes. Oh, I like it. Ooh. So I, I, yeah. I have to, I have to admit, I'm, I'm kind of a squealing infant in this world, uh, and I, I think, I think I understand what an NFT is, and I think I, I, I think I understand what a blockchain is, um, and I think in terms of, uh, of an avatar in terms of that, that an avatar is, represents you in a metaverse, uh, and in Artifact's case, uh, uh, the, the hope is that the avatar is translatable across, across worlds. But I have to say, this, this, is, this, is, this is quite a thing, uh, the, the, the fact that an avatar uh, becomes an economy becomes a place where, uh, 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 where items are, are bought and sold, where things are worn. And, and this, is, this is what absolutely just took my, set my hair on fire. Uh, at the bar before this event, uh, I, I, I was told of something called forging, where forging is, 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 a, is an NFT uh, that gives you the right to create a physical object to produce a physical object. So I, I hope that you could talk about this. No, so for this we came up, because when we created Artifact, we always thought that the future is gonna be mostly digital, right? But you still need, and, and that you know the physical world will become still important, but go towards more quality-driven, minimalistic type of conception, and that people are gonna stop you know, consuming dumbly, like you go to the McDonald's and you eat some stuff, and actually enjoy each object and understand the story and really have you know, even know where that object is from and who made it to go back, you know, to these roots of craftsmanship. And, and when we created Artifact, we thought, okay, like, we believe the future is gonna be 99.9%, .9%, you know, digital based, but we still need today so that pe to, so people can slowly understand that it's going that way to have something tangible. And because we love video games, you know, when you play Diablo or whatever, you know, role-playing game, you always go see the blacksmith to forge, you know, make your weapons better or forge you a new weapon. So we came up with the word forging because it's cool. And that's it. <laughs> and, we, and we thought, okay, that's a mechanic and, and it doesn't need, so the, the, and actually forging is almost like bridging because it always starts, always starts with the NFT and whatever we do, we always need to make sure that it starts in that, you know, simulation where digital is, you know, the, the, main, the main value, the main economy, the main emotional drive. And it always starts with the blueprint of the NFT from which, you know, just like some kind of a genie magic box, you have like some stuff coming out, right? And one of, some of these things can be a physical representation of it or a phys physical unlock because you, we thought a lot about this of, because digitally you're not constrained creatively, right? We can make the shoe animated, we can make crazy stuff, we can make, you know, lightning effects, whatever. Very hard to make lightning effects on a sneaker in the real world, right? So we always thought, okay, how do we translate and we make people understand that that NFT will keep on unlocking new things. It can be an object, it can be another NFT, it can be an experience. And the fact of forging, we do it at limited time events. Just like in Fortnite, you have a limited time live events because we think we live a lot more in a 
live world, and as well, I don't want to offer the service forever because good luck with uh, doing this as a business. Um, and we came up with this, like this limited time event where you can come and forge something from that precious NFT that you have. And we became known for this because I think people really, and I got the Jeff Staple shoes here, right? Like, I think it's really cool and magical to know that you have that thing and you hold it and until that forging moment and you forge it and then, you know, two weeks later or when we were slow, sorry for the, those who were slow to ship stuff at some point, like you receive, you know, a real box and even the, the physical item, we always put a lot of effort into it because we always linked it to video game collector editions. So I know, Ed, you don't know this, but you will know soon uh, that, you know, in video games, because, you know, video games started to be completely de dematerialized a long time ago with Steam and, you know, like digital distribution. But there are still, you know, geeks like me when, you know, Elden Ring, I took, of course, the collector edition. And where you have the statue and you have the mask, so you have this physical thing you can put in your, de your geek desktop and you're proud of it uh, <laughs> and your girlfriend wants to take it away. <laughs> so that's the, my girlfriend's really cool with this, so that's okay. Um, and so that was where we came from, like how do we give to these people who are really big, big, big fans something tangible and physical that most of them don't wear, I think. And that's interesting to know because we don't know are they wearing it because it's forged on something that was costed them $20,000 or are they keeping one to wear and one to rock, you know, in the sneaker side. So, and we're all about uh, merging world, just like Takashi is a lot as well with what he does. And what interests us a lot is always how do we merge things together, and, but it always needs to start with the digital, just like last week it was in New York, when last week we did our first party, et cetera, and we had to bring you know, a lot of the digital in the physical, and you know, we had the, this T-shirt that you're soon getting the digital, by the way, it's not me in charge of it, so don't blame me on Twitter. Um, but that's all we are about, like we like to merge these worlds and see you know, step by step, we think most of your life and world will be on the digital side, but with a physical life that is a lot more uh, healthy, you know, potentially spiritual, closer to the people you love, and consume less shit and, and you know, take real, real good stuff uh, every day. Wonderful. Well, um, there are a lot of fans of Takashi's in the audience, uh, and I almost feel like I'm monopolizing their time, so I do want to, uh, to uh, take questions uh, for Takashi. I, I think that uh, we have uh, the good old-fashioned microphone process. <laughs> so could, um, is this a question here? Go for it. I can start up me, I'm going to be much more boring than him, so he can prefer his thing. But yes, it does, because the, the, I, think the, I, was, I think the question is that when we create about the metaverse, do we think that what we're going to leave behind? Is that what you're, you're saying, basically? So I think us as Artifact, first, I want to leave behind the coolest brand that ever was, and, and, and mainly the coolest community that ever was, because I think our potential here, because we're in a moment in history that is very, very rare. I think it's happening every 20, 30 years where we have merging of culture and technology and a lot of subculture that were disregarded for a very long time that finally can come up and, and flip the table on, on people that used to control how we should think and consume, and I hate the word consuming. And I think what we can leave as a legacy and what we try to do every day at Artifact, even though it's not like we don't think 100 years from now, we don't think like this. But uh, every time we do something, we think, okay, like, we do the max, we do the coolest thing we can, bring in all the things we love together to really open a door. And we always think that after that, who's going to take that path and make it even, you know, better than us or, or, or in, inspire them to do better than us. So I think the legacy we will leave, hopefully, is for now a lot of people who are, as well, you know, making money thanks to us, which is great because it's different relationship with a brand. But mainly, hopefully, people will be very confident in what they are and what they believe in and especially understand that if you 
all this passion you were treated at as a geek or you know video games, anime, all of that, right now it's your superpower. Like us, we embrace that, and now you know we are very successful. And I still play video game every day, and I still watch anime as much as I can. But I think it's really inspiring that generation that was quite a lot of times uh, casted away or, or regarded as geek. And I think now it's the time for geeks to take over and 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 have a new world view and in, and and do a new uh, rule set for the world and creativity and business relationship. A lot inspired by internet, you know, type of organization, and that's what I think we want to live on is like a society that is, you know, just ruled differently and a different balance between creativity in business where creativity comes on top. Oh, okay. Very quickly, <laughs> uh, very quickly. I'm sorry. There are microphones at the front of the aisles for the audience. If you want to come down, then everyone will be able to hear you. Thank you. Great. Oh, can I? Sure. Oh, okay. あの、ちょっとあの、ずれちゃうかもしれないですけど、僕ま、怒ると思うんですよね。めっちゃ怒ると思う。でも僕、iTunes で随分CDっていうか音楽いっぱい買ったんですけど、ある日、アップルミュージックになっちゃって全部溶けちゃったんですよ。なくなっちゃった
and someone will you know, amass 100 clone X, and then they sell them all together in auction, I'm, I'm sure it would sell very well. So um, when I thought about this, um, I realized, oh, the, there's potential for NFT art, and it's not subculture, but it actually has a potential in the very long term. And so again, it might not be the kind of answer you were looking for, but as, um, when it comes to my involvement in NFT, NFT I was convinced that there is a, a longevity, and that's how, how I um, decided to go into it. Great, how about question number two? Oh, is that me? Yep. Okay, cool. Hi, um, I'm a game developer, so it was really neat to hear about both of you talk about how video games influence you to here we are now. I was curious, down the road, um, would you all ever be interested in like making an impact in the video game industry in like five to ten years? And if so, how would you kind of like to influence that as creatives? Wait, can you repeat your question? What's going to be the impact of blockchain on the game industry? Yes, if you all are ever interested in like I think it's, influencing it's, the it's, game industry down the road. Um, you, you got the question? Sorry, the, no, the, the, the impact part. of blockchain on the game industry? Of what, 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 what we think the impact of blockchain will have on the game industry in general in the future? That's the question. I start talking. <laughs> no, because you know, <laughs> it's, I, I it's my not, subject. I cannot okay. understand <laughs> for the game industry is what, right? I yeah. just, you know, I will release at the end of this year Tamagotchi, something like that. <laughs> Level no, is very, very low. No, Sorry. but I think, you know, that's part of it. I think the, you know, in game industry, there was the indie game movement that started, you know, you didn't have a, needed a hundred people to make a game in a studio and you didn't have to think about a big blockbuster and, you know, sell physical copies at uh, GameStop, I think you have in the US or something like that. And, and I think him, it's cool, he's making a Tamagotchi and thinking games because, you know, game as a medium, the, the buyers of entry has lowered a lot. And I think the fact that an amazing artist like Takashi can start to think of making a Tamagotchi and work on game mechanics and game developers is huge. Plus, it's going to be on blockchain. Just the blockchain side, I think it's, I think it's the future of the game industry, for sure. Uh, the only thing is I see it as a double-edged sword. You say that in English, I think? Uh, because right now, a lot of the blockchain games are, I think, very much, um, <laughs> how do you say, opportunistic. Uh, and because there's a demand for games, there's a demand for utility, but a lot of the games are actually bad and, uh, and not really fought long term. And as well, it's a lot of games that, you know, uh, in the history of the game industry, you had the uh, early access uh, era, you know, where you started to pay for games cheaper because they were not finished yet, and you had the relationship of being, you know, part of the game development with the developer, like Minecraft pioneered that, you know, 10 years plus, plus ago. And what I see in the blockchain industry right now is that they're doing even you know, pre-alpha pre monetization because you can actually own the asset in the game. The, game develop, the blockchain game developers are starting to unbundle these assets from the game experience and sell it to you. But because you can own, own them, you can already kickstart a secondary economy and, and the game economy before the game is actually play, playable even in alpha. Uh, so to me, that's great because it's allowing a lot of studios to actually fund their game without even needing any VCs or external investment. Uh, but the big risk is that the moment they launch their game, it better be a good game because it's, it's okay to make money to people and have the economy pre-game, but then after the game is actually to be good, even though it's a play-to-earn mechanic, uh, you will have some competition around, you know, people will always go towards a game that has a good gameplay loop and good, you know, artistic direction and that's actually made by really good game makers than just something that makes them purely money, I hope. And I don't want it to be replicated around what we've seen with mobile games that drove a lot of really bad game and ad addictive type of behaviors. And, you know, Facebook games or that era that, thank God, is kind of over right now. Uh, so I hope it's not going to replicate that. And the problem with the industry we're in is that there's a lot of money that all the media mostly talk about money. So that's, that's why it's great, you know, we're doing a talk with an actual curator in you know, the exhibition and start to talk about all of this because it's all driven by money. It's, re it's, it's, it's bringing a lot of people who are thinking how to make quick money, right? And we're lucky enough that the audience we're in, and you know, most of you are super enthusiastic, super passionate, and you know, very early adopter, and, 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 and you're you know, quite, um, uh, how do you say, forgiving. Uh, sometimes towards team, sometimes not. You're not forgiving and you're very impatient. We try to teach you to be patient. Uh, but so we're lucky on that. So I hope that just there's not going to be that many bad actors and there's bad actors everywhere in the world. You have a human being involved anyway. 
because if it was in Animal Crossing, there would be no bad actors at all. Uh, but I just hope that people, you know, don't get burnt out by some of the bad actors there is right now that are doing things related to blockchain and games before the actual people are deeply thinking about it and making something well crafted and with a lot of uh, passion and, and a real business model that works not only for them but for the community can actually put it out. And, and the big publishers, they're in an interesting situation where they know that it's going to be the future, but also internally they have a lot of people who think it's not good and it's, you know, it's breaking the way they're used to do it. And you always have resistant, uh, resistance uh, to change. And, and as well, because it's new to a lot of people, you have always have resistance towards the unknown. And me, I love the fact that it's unknown because if you play video games and have all that culture behind, it's as if you have a little uh, torchlight in the unknown and you kind of know where you're going. And so, yeah, just hope that it's going to be done the right way. But for sure, I think it's going to be shifting a lot of how people make and enjoy games and, and participate in game economies. That's going to be the biggest thing, which might as well be combined with the fact that, uh, you know, we're gonna all be going to be stuck at home because the environment is fucked up and we need to be play Fortnite, but actually earn money doing it, you know, so hopefully it works. I hate to do this because there's so much uh, energy uh, here tonight, uh, but maybe a couple of more questions. Could we have uh, another question here? Oh. I have um. one. I have one right here. <laughs> to the right. Oh. oh, over here. Okay. Oh, Marika? Hello. Yeah, I can't even see there. No, no worries. Sorry. Hello. Go ahead. I just want to say oh, arigato yeah. gozaimasu to Takashi Sama. Uh, I was at the Artifact party and he's a great dancer. If y'all haven't seen Takashi dance, Takashi can groove. You know, shout out to anybody in the building. Um, I just wanted to ask him uh, what was his best experience since being back in the U.S. so far? And then I also had a question for Benoit, which was um, how do you see your relationship with On Cyber? Um, you know what I'm saying, evolving because you guys give us the space pods. So I'm just interested, like, what, what do you think that relationship with you guys and the Open Metaverse project with Punk 6529? Thank you. Oh, nice question. <laughs> so because, uh, yeah, like, uh, uh, when I came back to these two years, uh, I cannot come back to the New York City. So passport control guide said, because I have a green card, uh, why you are not coming back to here? So you are Japanese and American? I said, American people? And uh, they said, why you, you know, so long to stay in Japan? I have to say some, you know, like kind of the answer. And then, you know, 30, 40 minutes, something like that, you know, conversation with uh, passport control people. And then, okay, you know, go home. Thank you so much. And then I go out from the, you know, this passport control and then breathing the air is exactly New York smell like. <laughs> oh, this is, uh, you know, New York, New York. Because, uh, you know, uh, it's it's kind of you know New York is uh, exactly you know I when I watching to the Titanic movie feels like a Titanic you know people like uh, you know oh I came to the frontier right came back to frontier so that moment was you know super you know uh, fresh you know uh, feeling and then I saw the landscape in the New York City it's beautiful beautiful. So that was, uh, you know, my first impression. I came back to New York, but, uh, you know, and uh, Los Angeles also, all weather is Los Angeles. But, uh, you know, this few days is too much chilly, so I am not ready for the, you know, winter cold or something. So I almost catch a call, something like that. Okay. Oh, no, good answer, maybe. Okay. And it was on the on cyber stuff. So, um, I mean, we're doing more things with them. I can't tell you what, but uh, of course, there's more more stuff coming. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we'll go to the. Um, Hi. To the right. There, there we go. Okay. The last question. 
Hello, Murakami-san. <laughs> you don't necessarily need to question here. <laughs> I wanted to ask one question. Um, since you mentioned your son and your daughter uh, in your artwork making process, it seems like has there been a change since you became a father? Are you more influenced by your children? And how has that changed how you create, if at all? Uh, I, I, my mind was big change last year. So my dad was dead. And almost same time to Borger Avro was dead. So that, you know, two dead is very close moment. And, uh, you know, mostly the Borgers, uh, you know, dead is a super huge impact. Because uh, he was 41 years old still, super young. So, uh, but uh, I am 60 years old. That means, okay, so I already, you know, must be done. Because, you know, uh, I have no future. So that is, uh, you know, I have to look for the another way. And then, you know, Benoit, so today, you know, many times say sci-fi, right? Sci-fi world. So if I will survive in this world, I have to, you know, uh, escape for the, some, you know, fantasy world, like a sci-fi stuff. That's why metaverse is a very good escape zone. So this is, uh, you know, my, my body and my family and my kids' lifetime. And, you know, kind of the used to say second world or something. So this is a completely different uh, kind of the jubilee. So I started to the, this new world. Maybe age is two years old. So kind of, you know, I am, um, you know, same level with my kids. So that's why, you know, inference from the kids, yes or no, is uh, exactly yes, because my old brother, old, you know, sister or something like that. So, but uh, I don't know. It's, uh, she's basically, she was uh, my employee <laughs> a long time ago. So, and she take care about the Los Angeles, you know, property. But uh, we cannot success about the big, uh, the gallery, business because she, I, you know, hire for her is exactly the same time that, like, a, you know, Lehman Brothers crash moment. <laughs> so <laughs> that is a very good timing. Now is a crashing for the market, right? <laughs> Marika-san. <laughs> Ooh, scary. <laughs> well, that, I, I think it's, uh a great last word, uh, Takashi. <laughs> um, uh, Takashi, thank you very much for being with us here. And thank you very much, Yuko, for joining us. And thank you very much, Benoit. For <laughs> and, and thanks to all of you for your, your spirit tonight. I uh, look forward to continuing this conversation. Have a great night. Thank you, Edo. <laughs> great. Tell me when will you be mine? Tell me quando, quando